we had things like we talked about one of the questions was the regulatory issues to overcome. We had various disclosures in the United States that we're not able to, we were not able to change. Uh, determination was made by our lawyers in Washington, D.C. that the government will not allow you to change this. You have to state interest on the form. Uh, our Sharia scholars are supportive in that regard. Uh, we have a fatwa that, to paraphrase it, it says something to the effect. Uh, you don't need to look at the disclosures that the government requires in order to have the product be compliant with Sharia, you look at the intentions of the parties and, the, and those documents that you can control and that you, you've done a good job on. So, um, so those, uh, and again, that's the law of the land that we had to comply with. Um, we had, we, earlier, um, the Sharia scholars were talking about the, the taxation and the fact that in the United States people try to, you know, we tried to dev devise the program so that it was Comply, you know, that, that the customers would get the benefit of the tax deduction for, in the tax deduction says interest deduction on the tax return. Uh, we send a 1098 uh, to the customers and we're required to do that uh, um, under the law. Um, and again, we had the uh, support of the Sharia board and our fatwa says something to the effect, the U.S. government can look at this transaction in a manner that is beneficial to our customers if that's the way the law of the land works doesn't change anything about our co-ownership agreement or the, or the Sharia compliance. Um, uh, we did have to change a number of, of things fundamental in the conventional area, that things such as late payments and things of um, losses on natural disasters and, and other areas where um, we, we were through our Sharia board and, and, and them pointing out if you're going to be a co-owner, you got to be a co-owner, and you, certain things you have to do as a co-owner that you can't just uh, discard and, and put on the consumer. Uh, we are, I guess, what was referred to as like a standalone mortgage company, but I think that's very much a misnomer these days, uh, and it always has been because we don't stand alone. We, it's been very important to have people that we work with that are committed to, um, that are flexible as far as in our. Um, strategic partners, things like investors. We had Freddie Mac, and we had, we have Freddie Mac. We, we had GMAC also in the, in the private area, and these are, are people that, that have devoted resources to say, we understand your, what, we're dealing, what you have to accomplish here, and we're accommodating our uh, IT systems and our way of viewing the transaction, characterizing the transaction, understanding the transaction, and, and really, um, saying it's really substance, the substance of the transaction. Our funding sources, uh, a lot of times you don't know where you're gonna get blindsided in this, in this environment where you have, um, the, the mortgage industry was, of course, it's a mess. It, it, was a, it is a mess, it was a mess. And um, even though we may have been doing well and been doing, um, even in a bad market, we were actually, we have been increasing our, our um, originations. But you have somebody that has the funding that, that you also have to do as you know want to do Islamically, and then they they get um, they have issues with their finances, and now they don't want to participate in the mortgage related field at all. Um, mortgage insurance in the United States was another area that we had to overcome, so the customers wouldn't have to come with 20% down. We wanted to do that in a manner that's Sharia compliant as well, so that the securitizations, everything, the person that buys the securitizations will buy something that is is complete. Um, we have created in our co-ownership program a limited liability company to participate as a co-owner in each one of these contracts. That created issues with um, the tax. Um, uh, in the area of uh, tax, uh, uh, transfer tax, when we've got an LLC that's on the title with the customer, t different uh, tax issues from um, doing something different. Uh, also, um, title company, settlement people, having people that we explain the program to, reaching a person that can buy in and then can disseminate the information down to others is very helpful because you don't want to get one minute. Okay, so you don't want to get people that don't know, uh, don't want to help you, or don't have time to help you, or just say, this is something different. I don't really understand how this works, and therefore I'm, I'm going to make your, you have to work harder or less efficient. That's why when we've had the opportunity to work with this next gentleman who's going to speak, it's been an absolute pleasure because here you have a good businessman and you have somebody 
hey, I understand Islamic finance. You don't have to explain what kind of structure you have. You don't have to explain why you can't do certain things or you, you, you can do certain things. Or and So maybe that's a good segue. Sure. Thanks, Tom. Uh, again, Stephen Ranzini, uh, founder, president, CEO of University Islamic Financial and also the University Bank. Uh, Tom, I'll just start with Tom's point about collaboration. It's a small industry. We work together. Uh, there is an ecosystem of entities, Tom was mentioning, you know, whether it's title companies, uh, insurance companies, uh, investors, including uh, government investors, uh, Freddie Mac. Uh, you know, we, we also collaborate our organizations directly. There's things that, uh, you know, we do well they don't have an interest in doing, we'll do that for them, uh, and uh, someday perhaps vice versa. So, uh, and we're open to, to all of that. And, you know, as a business philosophy, uh, <clears throat> my bank uh, serves uh, other financial institutions as their trusted back office. Uh, for example, credit unions, we, we serve 2.9% of all the credit unions in the whole United States for some aspect of their mortgage business, and that's what helps gives us the scale to be able to actually compete in this particular Islamic finance business. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of different uh, numbers have been tossed around about how many Muslims are there in the United States, and the best research that I've seen is, and I have to say I'm a very keen observer of these <clears throat> server surveys and studies, because, you know, as uh, uh, head strategist for my company, I like to know how big is this market that I'm trying to address. And anyway, so the best that I've seen is that there's 2.4 Muslim, million Muslims in the United States, of which a half million are children. And that leads me to the conclusion, uh, based on uh, household size and such, that there might be as many as perhaps uh, 800,000 households. <clears throat> Knowing the scope of what guidance has done, we have done, and s some of our smaller competitors have done, that means that there's about a 1% take up to date in the United States among the Muslim community uh, on the home finance side. Uh, and, you know, we've been at it eight years, they've been at it 10 years. So, th you know, this is not uh, a, uh, uh, something that you open the doors and the world will come to you of the Muslim community. It's a, a very much a uh, individual sale. <clears throat> uh, one of the other speakers mentioned uh, Habitat for Humanity. Uh, it's a, a Christian uh, charitable organization proud to say, actually, I helped found uh, two of their chapters in Michigan. Um, and another aspect I'll mention of that is that the, the home purchase price being at a discount, um, they want to assure themselves that the buyer of the home isn't just in it for a short-term gain and flip the, flip the home for profit and move on. So what they do is they actually put a, they call it a soft second mortgage on the, uh, on the deed. Uh, which is a non-interest bearing uh, mortgage which amortizes in equal installments over 20 years typically so that if the homeowner lives and stays in the home for 20 years uh, they receive the benefit of that initial discount but if they don't they have to pay uh, Habitat uh, to uh, absorb some of that profit so that they, they can't just take a profit and flip the house. So it's interesting that there is actually a, a non-interest bearing mortgage involved in that product already. Which leads kind of the, the, the thought about uh, cross-religious adoption of Islamic finance products. And, and is there, you know, cross-religious adoption of Islamic finance products in the United States? And um, I, I say to that, uh, absolutely yes. Uh, interesting but true. Uh, so, for example, uh, the best example I can give you is on the uh, investment products or mutual fund side, where uh, the mono mutual funds have 85% of their $2.75 billion of funds from non-Muslims. And you say, well, why is that? Well, it's because there's a very strong incentive for people to invest their investment dollars in an Islamically compliant way. And you say, well, why is that? Well, years ago in a prior life, uh, 25 years ago, I was uh, designing mutual funds for the Tira Price mutual fund family. Uh, so I have some understanding as to what investors are looking for. And the nirvana of investment uh, advisors is to find 
an excess return or alpha that you can gain with low risk or low beta. 